Good morning and happy Sabbath, everyone. How's everyone's morning going so far? Good? Yes? Yes? How many of you guys had a good week this past week? How many of you guys didn't have a good week this week? And that's okay. That's all right. Um, because whether you had a good week, a tiring week, a terrible week, or an amazing week, we are all here today worshiping the Lord. Amen? Amen. My name is Ridge, everybody. I'm the associate pastor here at this church. And before I start my sermon, normally, if this is your first time in church or you don't normally consider yourself as a churchy person, sometimes when you go to church, there is a call and response that happens between the speaker and the audience. And when the speaker says, God is good, the congregation says. And when the speaker says, all the time, the congregation says. So let's try that out right now. God is good, and all the time, do you guys believe that? Yes, amen, amen. I, I believe that. Um, and, and when we really internalize and believe and trust in God's goodness, I think the, the way we live our life drastically changes, amen? And so this morning, we are actually in the part two of our mini-series called The Welcome Table. Last time I preached a couple weeks ago, uh, I preached about the story of Zacchaeus and how Zacchaeus was literally uh, a government worker being moved by the Spirit of God to allow Jesus into his home so that he is able to be a follower of Jesus at the end of the day. But what we learn even more so is that we as Christians can practically express this faith in God by inviting other people into our home and sharing something as simple like a meal with them. And so this morning, we're going to be doing part two of our series, and I think it's so powerful. It's one of my favorite stories in Scripture, because you know, a lot of times when people ask you the question, what's your favorite story in the Bible? Sometimes my mind goes to, oh, the story of Joseph, or the story of Moses, or the story of David and Goliath. But honestly, right now, if you were to ask me right here, right now, my favorite story in the Bible is going to be the one that we'll be talking about today. But before we start, let us all have a word of prayer. I'm going to kneel. You guys can if you'd like, but please join me as a word of prayer. Father in heaven, we thank you, we praise you, we love you, and are so grateful for your nearness towards us. Lord, thank you so much for the Sabbath, the day in which we could inhale and exhale knowing that you are in control of every single aspect of our lives, Father. You are in control of our finances, our families, our workplaces. Father, you are even in control of, of how we decide to live our lives because, Father, when we give our lives to you, we are able to do your good and perfect will. And so, Lord, we right now express our faith and our gratitude in the Sabbath that you've given us. Lord, I pray that you would Allow us to understand what the story says in Luke chapter 24, the amazingness, the, the, the humor perhaps, and, and even, Lord, the intimacy and the deep truth that we get to learn in the text. And so, Lord, may the spirit that you've promised us, the spirit that lives in our hearts, may it, Father, teach us and transform us into the new creation that you've called us to be. Amen. And, Lord, I pray that you would be with me. Lord, hide me behind your cross. May Jesus and him crucified and resurrected be uplifted and not me, Father. May the words that come out of my mouth may not belong to me, Father, but belong to you. We pray this in your name. Amen. Amen. How many of you guys consider yourselves a sucker for a good story? <laughs> yes? I am a sucker for a good story. When somebody says, dude, guess what? My mind is like, whoa, Yes! Tell me, you know. <laughs> Whether it's my friend coming up to me, telling me something so cool that had happened to him, or maybe like a book that I'm reading, or maybe a movie that someone recommended me, or a show, or even some music albums that tell stories, I am a sucker for a good story. Amen. And I think, I think it's so cool that a lot of us here consider ourselves some story buffs. Some of us like to read stories and kind of dissect the little details and the incutrice, in, incutrice, uh, what, 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 what is that? 
incredulous. <laughs> Man, that's all right. You guys know what I mean. I'm Filipino, but I was born here. But the details, the details. <laughs> The details of a story, we dissect them, we try to understand them, the nuances. See, that's a good word, that's easier to say. The nuances of the story. And I think there's something deeply human about our gravitation and our, and our attraction to stories. Because even before movies and books and music, human beings literally gathered around a campfire to tell stories throughout time, throughout history. So there's something not only divine, but something deeply human about being able to sit down and hear what somebody has to say about what happened to them last week, whether it's good or bad. And I think, I truly believe that the Bible tells the greatest story to have ever existed in human history. It's fascinating, and, and I know what you're saying. Oh, yeah, you're a pastor. Of course the Bible is your favorite story. Like, no, 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 no. It is, because it's fascinating when you think about the claim of Scripture and, and the, the story that the Bible is trying to tell, and something that we learn is that the Bible tells the story. This book right here tells the story of how God wants to restore his relationship with you. Do you guys know that? Because it's very easy, again, to look through this scripture, to look at this ancient text, to go through books like Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, come across books that you have no idea how to pronounce names like Habakkuk, and be confused about what it's about. But in summary, the book, the Bible, tells the story of how God wants to restore his relationship with you. And the Bible can be quite simply be broken up into different categories, but what you realize is that even in the different movements of the story of Scripture, each movement tells of the relational characteristics of God. For example, under pre-creation, before even God decides to create the heavens and the earth, the Bible tells us that God was present not only in the Father and the Son and the Spirit, but He was also present with the angels and the heavenly host. But it's fascinating because when you think about God as a trinity, that tells us that God is an other-centered being. What do I mean by that? In order for love to exist, there needs to be at least three parties existing within that entity. And let me explain. Can a toxic relationship happen between two people, yes or no? Yes, absolutely, because those two people can go at each other and they can ignore the rest of the world. But let's use the example of a husband and wife. They love each other, they're spending time with one another, but the moment a child enters the picture, how does that change the dynamic between the husband and the wife? One of them has to realize, or both of them have to realize that, oh, whoa, with this new child, I have to realize that I won't get as much attention as I have been getting before with my wife. And the husband has to think the same thing. And so in some sense, the father, son, and the spirit have to share relationship with each other and realize that, whoa, 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 it's not just about me, but it's about all of us. And so from this place of relational growth, from this place of, 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 of other-centered love, comes the creation of the world. God didn't just create the world because he was bored. Does that make sense? God didn't just create the world because he had nothing better to do, but because God was a God of love, because God was a God who, who desires to be in a relationship with you, from that place he decided to create. But as we know from page three of scripture, chapter three, after he creates the sun, the moon, the stars, the whales, and everything that we see, after he creates the human beings, we see quite quickly that the fall happens. That Adam and Eve, the humans of this world, the, the pinnacle of God's creation, decides to sever the relationship that humans have between God and man. Because humans decided to worship another God other than God himself. But thankfully, even in the midst of their, of their wickedness, 
even in the midst of their disobedience, God in Genesis 3 verse 15 promises a covenant that one day he will restore this relationship between man and God. And so the rest of the story of Scripture, particularly the Old Testament, basically tells the story of how God chooses one family, one nation, the father of Abraham, to save the world and to be a blessing to the rest of the world so that, that, so that God can restore his relationship with the rest of humanity. But what we soon find out is that Israel, the nation of Israel, actually finds it very difficult to actually stay faithful to what God was calling them to do. And so what happens? God stays faithful by sending not just another Jewish man, but rather sending himself in the form of the Messiah. Now imagine this, that in the middle of all this conflict going on, in the middle of all this idolatry, in the middle of the enemy, the Satan, working in the midst of of Israel and the world, that God decided not to give up in his plan to restore his relationship with you and I. And when we meet the character of Jesus, Jesus is an awesome person when we read about him in the Gospels, amen? He is such a, an elusive figure. He's, he's funny. He's kind. He's intimate. He's, 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 he's just such a cool, oh man, I'm, like, I'm, I'm Californian, so the word that comes into my head is like, man, Jesus is cool. Because he is. And what you realize in the story of Jesus is that everything that he did was so that he can be near you and I. But as a reader of the Bible, you, you soon find out that Jesus, this Messiah figure, is executed by the empire of Rome. He's executed not only by the officials and the authorities, but he's actually executed by the orders of the religious leaders of the time. The very people that were supposed to be the light of the world were actually responsible of killing the Messiah. But what's fascinating now is that as we get to the story, now, now the scene is set for my favorite story. As we know, Jesus rises at the third day, and there's this weird in-between period between Jesus resurrecting and Jesus giving the disciples the great commission, and that story can be found in Luke chapter 24, verses 13 to 35. And so if you guys have your Bibles, please turn your Bibles to Luke chapter 24, verses 13 to 35. Normally, normally I would have a lot of the text up into the screen behind me, but because this is a large portion of Scripture and I want every one of us to actually look at it in our own Bibles, I want all of us to bring out your phone, bring out your actual Bible so that we can read it together. Amen? Amen. Luke chapter 24, verses 13 to 35. If you're there, say amen. amen. Nice, nice, nice. Luke chapter 4, verses 13 to 35. Jesus resurrected, but the disciples don't know it yet. They're sad, they're devastated, and perhaps they probably feel like they wasted the past three and a half years of their life. So with those emotions, we finally get to this interesting story in Luke chapter 24, verse 13. Everyone there? The Bible says, And behold, two of them, were going that very day to a village named Emmaus, which was about seven miles from Jerusalem. And they were talking with each other about all these things which had taken place. While they were talking and discussing, don't miss this here, Jesus himself approached and began traveling with them. But their eyes were prevented from recognizing them. And Jesus says this in verse 17, and he said to them, what are these words that you are exchanging with one another as you are walking? Isn't this funny? Let's stop this. Let's stop this right here. So what's happening in the story so far? Two disciples are walking. They're sad, correct? They're sad. Why are they sad? Because Jesus was just executed by the state. There there, there was this stuff going on, like there's riots and everything. There were people on the road, like everybody knew what had happened. And suddenly, as these two disciples were walking on the road, sad, talking about what had happened, there's this mysterious figure that comes up behind them 
and says, what are you guys talking about? Isn't Jesus funny? Because if I were Jesus, you know what I would have done? I would have done like a Damascus experience. If I saw those two disciples walking, I would have just struck a bolt of lightning, had all the heavenly angels blow their trumpets, and as I float down from heaven, I would have Chris Tomlin sing, how great is our God, sing with me, how great. That's what I would do. But Jesus, being so funny, decided to walk up behind them and say, oh, why are you guys so sad? What are you guys talking about? But notice again in the text, let's look again. Let's see, what, what text was it? Verse 16, where it says, but their eyes were prevented from recognizing him. Isn't that fascinating? Their eyes were prevented from seeing Jesus. And, and I don't think the text is saying that Jesus kind of blocked their vision intentionally. What I do think, though, is that sometimes when you are so filled with pain and regret and perhaps shame, those three things can distort your view of reality. Sometimes when there are tears in your eyes, you can't even see the world correctly, especially losing someone like your best friend, Jesus. But notice that even though those disciples were in pain, that their pain couldn't push away Jesus. That maybe you're here right now thinking that your pain and your tragedy and your life experience and your trauma, everything that happened to you is too much for Jesus to handle? No, 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 my friend. Jesus leans into you and listens to you. And so this is happening. Jesus asks them the question, what are these words that you are exchanging with one another as you are walking? And they stood still and looked sad. Verse 18, we come up to a dilemma. What dilemma, you ask? Let's keep reading. One of them, named Cleopas, answered and said to him, look at this, are you the only one visiting Jerusalem and unaware of the things which had happened here in these days? What is he saying? Do you live under a rock? <laughs> are you crazy? Did you, did you not just hear what, what happened? Like, did you just go on a trip and came back? And what do you think Jesus said? Let's keep reading. Verse 19. And he said to them, what things? <laughs> what things? I bet you that the, these two disciples that, that, that Jesus were talking to, they were probably just done with this dude. They're like, what? What things? Who, who is, first of all, who is this stranger, this weird guy trying to follow us all around and I'm sad, but they have no idea what's going on? And so the verse continues. In verse 19, Jesus says, what things? And they said to him, the things about Jesus, the Nazarene, who was a prophet, mighty in deed and in word in the sight of God and all the people, and how the chief priests and our rulers delivered him to the sentence of death and crucified him. But we were hoping that it was he who was going to redeem Israel. Indeed, besides all this, it is the third day since these things have happened. But also, some woman among us amazed when they were at the tomb early in the morning and did not find his body, they came saying that they had also seen a vision of angels who said that he was alive. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just exactly as the woman also had said, but him they did not see. So Cleopas, this, this, this individual is trying to explain, well, you know, the, 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 the person, the Jesus of Nazareth, he was executed, but what I do remember him saying was that he did say that he would be crucified and resurrect on the third day, but today is the third day and nothing has happened. So they're in this weird in-between. And in response, what do you think Jesus says? Jesus, again, they don't know that this is Jesus. This is a complete stranger. 
Verse 25, and he, Jesus, said to them, O foolish men and slow of heart to believe in all that the prophets had spoken. Was it not necessary for the Christ to suffer these things and to enter into his glory? And I wish I could be a fly on the wall in this text right here. (laughs) Then beginning with Moses and with all the prophets, he explained to them the things concerning himself and all the scriptures. Could you imagine being a fly on the wall, hearing Jesus break down the scriptures at this moment? Whoa. And you'd think, you think it is at this moment that the disciples would be like, whoa, what? I get it now. But when we continue the story, we see something else actually happen. Verse 28, and they approached the village where they were going, because again, they were on the road to, to Emmaus, and he, and he, being Jesus, acted as though he was going farther. So essentially, they were walking to Emmaus, Jesus has nowhere to go, and so the two disciples get to their destination, and Jesus is acting as if he has to go somewhere else. Jesus, where do you have to go? There's, there's, there's nowhere you have to go. Do, do you have like a, like a reminder list or a to-do list? Jesus is basically trying to play with them. But, verse 29, even though all this had happened, they urged him, saying, Stay with us, for it is getting toward evening, and the day is now nearly over. Even though these disciples were in pain, even though they were troubled by everything that was going on, they were willing to welcome a stranger into their midst and show them love. So he went in to stay with them. And when he had reclined at the table with them, can you imagine that? Before, again, we talked about the story of Scripture, how God is is three in one. He's creator. He speaks and things happen. And in Luke chapter 24, the Bible tells us that Jesus sat at the table and he reclined. The Son of God, God in human form, was leaning back (laughs) at the table. Isn't that such a cool, what does that tell you about God? That God is cool. (laughs) He is a real guy. He was just chilling. Willing and wanting to be in relationship with his disciples, even though they were in the middle of deep pain. So when he had reclined at the table with them, don't miss this right here. This is the key. He took the bread and blessed it and breaking it, and he began giving it to them. Then their eyes were opened, and they recognized him. And what happened after that, friends? And he vanished from their sight. Wow. Cool story, right? Jesus literally was at the table with them. They were walking together. He had a Bible study with them. They invited Jesus to their house. Jesus reclined at the table like a cool guy, broke the bread, blessed it. They finally see, oh, snap, this is Jesus. And the moment they saw, he's gone. (sighs) What does that tell you about Jesus? One, Jesus is real. Two, Jesus is willing to meet you where you are at and to comfort you, to tell you that he loves you. But more so, Jesus actually teaches us something very amazing about what it means to be his follower and his disciple. And let me ask you this, and we probably answered this already. But at what point of the story did the disciples recognize Jesus? Was it at the Bible study or was it at the table? At the table. Verse 35, I have this text up here. They began to relate their experiences on the road and how he was recognized by them in the, what? In the breaking of the bread. This is important because we realize that Jesus broke the bread. This wasn't the first time that Jesus broke bread. He broke the bread at the Passover feast hours before he was crucified. 
But what this tells me about Jesus is that even though he had to explain the scriptures, expound the scriptures from Genesis all the way to the end of the Hebrew testimony, that even though he did all of that, that that in and of itself was not enough. That Jesus knew that he had to have a relationship with people in order for them to realize, oh no, this thing is real. So what does that tell us as Christians? That your demonstration strengthens your proclamation. Did you know that? Your demonstration strengthens your proclamation. A lot of times we like to proclaim. We as a Seventh-day Adventist church are very good at the proclaiming part. Very, very good. And we shouldn't stop, amen? Amen. But when it comes to the demonstration part, that's where we kind of get weak need a little bit. It's important too, not not only in in our Christian walk, but also in in everyday life to know that what you say really matters and what when you say yes, it means yes, and when you say no, it actually means no. So at home, my dad has has a water filter, a really fancy water filter called Kangen water. Are you guys familiar with that? Yes? No? Kathy? Yes, that makes sense. You're, you're familiar with it. <laughs> Kangen water. It's, it's like alkaline. I don't know. I'm not going to act like I know what it is. But it's alkaline water. Every time I go to my house, I drink from it. it. Tastes nice. Yada, yada, yada. So my dad was trying to convince me to buy one. He was like, Ridge, you know, if you get Kangen water, it has the right type of pH levels in it. You could use it for this. You could use it for that. And, and it even has a feature or some way, somehow, that you're able to wix mix oil and water together and make it one solution. And I said, what? For those of you who took chemistry, if you put oil in water, what happens? It separates. And so when my dad said, yeah, dude, well, my dad didn't call me dude. He didn't call me dude. (laughs) Well, my dad was trying to demonstrate to me, he was trying to show me, yeah, this thing, Kangen water thing, could mix water and oil. I was like, no way. So we went home, and he did it. He said, you ready? I'm like, yeah, I'm ready. (laughs) He had a little cup with oil, filled it with the kangen water, and he was like, watch this, Ridge. Pulled out a spoon, begins to mix. He mixes it, and what do you think happens? It doesn't mix. (laughs) And I'm in his face, and I'm like, ha, ha, you wasted $1,000 on this thing, homie. (laughs) It's still good water. I use it every time. But imagine if it did work. What do you think I would have done? I would have bought that thing, of course. Would I, would I use it all the time? No. Would I use it as a gag trick whenever people come to my house? Of course. But if his demonstration matched his proclamation, I would have acted differently. While that is humorous, I understand Could it be that a lot of people in our modern world today don't enjoy coming to church, don't enjoy being around other Christian people because we haven't done a good job at the demonstrating part? Could it be that this generation of churchgoers and disciple makers here are being called by God to actually live out what he says and tell what he says. Could it be that God doesn't only want us to proclaim, but he also wants us to demonstrate what he does? Again, there's, there's, there's always a place to proclaim. We need to proclaim. If anything, we need to proclaim more that Jesus is coming soon. Amen? Amen. But we have to act like it too. And here's the thing, when we act like it, when we believe it, and when we live our lives and carry ourselves according to the truths that we believe, it'll inform people, oh, snap, this person really means business. And here's what the story of Jesus tells us in Luke chapter 24. Again, after Jesus had disappeared, the disciples said this, they said to one another, were not our hearts burning within us while he was speaking to us on the road, while he was explaining the scriptures to us? It was then, right then and there, after Jesus had a relationship with them, that they finally found a connection between, oh, that's what he meant. 
It's easy to break down prophecy. It's easy to open up your Bible in front of somebody. It's easy to give them a glow track, a video, a book, anything. It's easy to give people information. But to show them transformation is a whole different battle in itself. Friends, don't just tell the story of Scripture. Live it. There's a subtle promise and a subtle warning in the book of James, chapter 1, verses 23 to 25, that says this. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man who looks at his natural face in a mirror. For once he has looked at himself and gone away. He has immediately forgotten what kind of person he was. But one who has looked intently at the perfect law, the law of what? Freedom, and has continued in it, not having become a forgetful hearer, but an active doer. This person will be blessed in what he does. The word for blessed here in the book of James quite literally means happy or content. Could it be that the missing link in our relationship with Jesus is us finally stepping out of our comfort zone and doing what he calls us to do. As I mentioned a couple weeks ago, today on August 27, this afternoon, there are a handful of us that will be hosting a welcome table at our house. The welcome table is an initiative, a discipleship effort of our church, the Fort Myers Seventh-day Adventist Church, to share meals with those people who would not normally walk through the doors of our church. And even more so, not only are we wanting to schedule that to happen this afternoon with different people that we have been mentioning these past couple weeks, we are also willing to sponsor a portion of the groceries of the meals that we are cooking for these people who we want to come into our homes. Having missional meals with people in our community should be a part of our lifestyle. But we at the Fort Myers Church want to encourage you to have these meals with people. And so maybe you are hosting somebody today and you're needing some prayer and maybe you are wanting to maybe schedule a last minute kind of lunch at your house. If you would like to do so, please remember to sign up and to put your your form at fortmyerschurch.churchcenter.com so that we're able to get a count of how many welcome tables we're hosting and whether or not you want the reimbursement, we would please want every participant to sign up today. But... Naturally, the reason why we're doing this, and this is my last scripture text that I want to share, and I want to invite the praise team up as we sing our closing hymn. The Bible says in Matthew chapter 25, verse 35, this is Jesus speaking. He says, for I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty and you gave me drink. I was a stranger and you welcomed me. And the king will answer them, Truly I say to you, as you did it to the one of the least of these, my brothers, you did it to me. When we welcome Jesus, excuse me, when we welcome the least of the brethren, when we welcome the least of these people into our homes, little do we know is that we're really welcoming Jesus into our home himself. When we not only tell people of Jesus, but we also show people Jesus' love then the world can be turned upside down. If there's anything I want us to remember today is that your demonstration strengthens your proclamation. Amen. Amen. Now, please join me as we stand, as we sing our closing hymn, Wondrous Love. If you want to follow the notes, it's hymn number 162 in the hymnal in front of you. Uh, This is unfamiliar to a lot of us. (laughs) Thank <laughs> you. 
Thank you so much for setting a table before us, Father, for welcoming us into your presence every single day of our lives, Father. Thank you, Lord, for sending Jesus so that he was able to set us free, Father, so that we're able to live these lives that you've called us to live, so that, Lord, we're not only able to tell people about you, Father, but we could show people what it means to be a disciple of yours. Lord, may we love when we need to love. May we be patient with people when people get on our nerves. May we listen when people are, are telling us different things. Father, may we be, may we be kind when, when the world doesn't want us to be kind. But Father, most importantly, most importantly, Father, may we love as you have loved us. We pray this in your son's name. Amen.